This is Far From Home. I'm Scott Gurian. I want to start off by welcoming all of you who just discovered my show after hearing my recent piece on Planet Money. I'm so glad you've joined me. And if any of you don't know what I'm talking about, check out the other episode I just released in my feed. The story featured the Central Asian country of Turkmenistan, which is probably one of the most obscure countries in the world, and certainly not a place that most of us hear much about, much less visit. Only about 10,000 tourists a year cross its borders, but in the summer of 2016, my brother, my friends Rosie and Jane, and I were some of the lucky few. We drove across Turkmenistan as part of an 11,000-mile road trip we were taking from London to Mongolia, raising money for charity. I actually documented every step of that journey on the very first season of this podcast, and if you haven't heard it, I highly recommend you go back and check it out because it's pretty entertaining. Anyway, of the 18 countries we visited, Turkmenistan was undoubtedly one of the most memorable, and the episodes I produced about our time there remain some of my favorites I've ever made for the show. So, as an introduction to Far From Home for all of you new listeners, I thought I'd re-release an excerpt of my story from Season 1, Episode 11. It's called Turkmenistan Just Plain Weird. Turkmenistan isn't exactly a place many people go on vacation. After North Korea, it's generally thought of as one of the most isolated, reclusive, and authoritarian nations in the world, and some journalists have even described it as a hermit kingdom. It's a place few outsiders ever get the chance to visit, so we felt privileged we were able to get visas, even though they were only good for five days. Our journey began after we bid farewell to our guide in Iran and arrived at the Turkmenistan border station, an imposing white marble government building on a hill, adorned with a giant portrait of the country's president. We parked our car behind the cars of several other Mongol rally teams that had arrived there before us, and we entered a noisy, cavernous room with high ceilings to begin processing our paperwork. I turned to my brother and muttered under my breath. This is probably the least inviting entrance to a country I've ever seen. Seriously, it was like we were in the middle of a construction zone. There were guys on scaffolds spackling and painting the walls, and there was dust and paint chips covering the floor and even the seats, so we had to brush things off before we sat down. I joked with Rosie. I mean, they're repainting it. It'll probably, next time you come to Turkmenistan, it'll be a lovely entrance. (laughs) Meanwhile, young soldiers stood around the room watching us. It looks like this whole place is being run by 19-year-olds in uh, camo uniforms, fulfilling their mandatory military service. They wore these giant silver belt buckles and broad-brimmed ranger hats, and they looked bored. One of them took out a brush and began polishing his boots. The other thing about this room, which I didn't immediately notice, was that the only illumination came from the sunlight streaming in the windows. You said the power is out? In- Electricity is out. Yeah. Well, this whole building, I guess. Why there's no lights on? Well, I don't know. I thought the lights are always off. That's just how they welcome you to Turkmenistan <laughs> in the dark. Few people spoke more than a handful of words in English, and customer service didn't quite seem like one of their strengths but we did our best to go with the flow. So we've handed our passports and our printed out visas to someone on the other side of a wall. They took it, slammed the door shut, and we're waiting here now for who knows how long. A guy we spoke to from one of the other teams told us he'd already been there over an hour, and it looked like the customs officials had now left on some sort of break. Rosie caught sight of one of them taking a nap. I just don't understand like logistically what they do like when when they hold your passports for hours like what are they actually doing i know it's not computerized none of it so obviously that adds some time my brother joked that they were probably all in the back binging on netflix rosie remarked that they were just acting like government workers in many parts of the world who don't have any incentive to actually give a shit Finally, they returned with our passports. A woman unlocked the door and ushered us into a room with a desk, which she called the bank. The power was still out, so it was pitch black in there, but we all held up our cell phones to provide light while she collected our money for the visa processing fee, all the while shouting something that none of us could understand. This was our first exposure to how we'd soon realize things tended to work in post-Soviet Central Asia. 
After that, we shuffled from building to building and office to office, filling out all sorts of mysterious forms and signing our names to documents we barely understood. Basically, we just did whatever they told us, because really, what other choice did we have? By the way, if you've ever wondered if there's anywhere in the world where they still use carbon paper, like actual black carbon paper, I could report that Turkmenistan is one of the holdouts. The whole experience was incredibly exhausting, and it felt like we were trapped in some sort of bureaucratic version of an Escher painting. Finally, after a quick inspection of our car's contents and one more check of our visas and passports, we were allowed to enter the country. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Are we all set? We're finished? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Yes, yes, you're finished. Okay. Don't worry, yeah. sir. Okay. You are in Turkmenistan. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate no it. Problem. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. We adjusted our watches for the odd half-hour time change, and then my brother Drew and I set out on our way. And we're driving now on this two-lane road that's basically just these amazing scenic mountains. And, uh, whoa. <laughs> Are we going to drive through safari? It really looks like that. There was uh, some horses on the side of the road a little while back, and now there's these wild, I want to say they're gazelles or something. They're sort of oh, like that deer, one, that but... big one in front has horns. They're those, yeah, those big horns, like, yeah, pointing back backwards. Curved, pointing backwards. Look at these mountains. These mountains amazing. are amazing. We're technically not allowed to take any photos here because it's on a military base, but it's, it's hard to resist. This scenery is just awe-inspiring. I didn't know anything about Turkmenistan, but I was envisioning just all flat desert. So I guess we are exiting the base here. We're going through a gate. There's barbed wire all around. We are coming to the other side. And there's some soldiers walking down the road in uh, military camo garb with um, big guns slung over their shoulders. It's quite an interesting welcome to a country. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're, they're not particularly known for their military, are they? Turkmenistan isn't really known for anything. No one even, <laughs> seriously, no one thinks of Turkmenistan. No. It's just not a country that most people even know exists. I mean, this was all part of the Soviet Union until a few decades ago. We'd been driving through the wilderness with rolling hills and mountains that extended as far as we could see in all directions, when suddenly we rounded a corner and saw the skyline of Ashgabat, Turkmenistan's capital city, off in the distance. That's impressive. We followed the road down from the mountain, drove through the city's ceremonial gate, and entered its outskirts, and it immediately seemed different from anywhere else we'd ever been. I was trying to figure out just what it was about this place, but Drew put his finger on it pretty quickly. <laughs> Everything is white. It's horrible. That's true. I hadn't thought of that. He was describing the mile after monotonous mile of grandiose government buildings and nearly identical-looking apartment blocks made of white marble imported from Italy. It all seemed a bit artificial. Like, you know that feeling when a friend or a relative who you're not very close to buys you a fancy birthday gift thinking you'll love it, but you have no use for it and it's not at all your style? That's kind of how Ashgabat felt. I read up on the city's history, and most of it was apparently destroyed in a giant earthquake back in 1948, which killed 100,000 people. It was rebuilt during the Soviet era, and then over the past few decades after the country became independent, large swaths of neighborhoods were demolished and rebuilt once again to make room for this more modern architecture, as well as monuments to the country's former leader, who banned the circus, ballet, and opera, renamed the days of the week and the months of the year after himself and his relatives, and built a giant 24-carat gold-leaf statue of himself that rotated to always face the sun. Our guidebook had described Ashgabat as a cross between Las Vegas and Pyongyang, and we thought that seemed about right. Everything was a bit over the top, so it was hard not to drive around with our jaws constantly open. Where are we, my brother kept asking. What is that thing up on the hill? There's a kind of monument, a big pointy thing. There's these strange buildings down there. It's like that oval building and yeah. the one next to it. See that gold yeah. thing? Like, that's incredible looking. It looks like a UFO. Look at that big monument there on the left. This is really like Disney World. It's one monument after another. Like Look at the other... landscape. Everything is so pristine. The perfectly manicured grass and 
shrubbery around the sides. It's kind of yeah. sterile. Yeah, very sterile. A little bit soulless. Oh, completely soulless. But at least initially, that's where our reactions diverged. This is really fascinating. It's so uncomfortable with it. I just go with the flow. Just. Uh... <laughs> I feel like we're in outer space. It's a substantial city with all new infrastructure and nobody here. Which brings me to the other thing we noticed that was really odd. Considering this was Turkmenistan's largest city, with a population of more than a million, the streets were strangely quiet, with hardly any other people or vehicles in sight. It looks like the city is brand new and has never been touched. Yeah, basically. Like we're the it, first people to drive on these newly opened roads. Pretty much. It looks like the city just opened for business. <laughs> this, is, this must be what it feels like to go to a city after like a nuclear explosion. There's nobody here. Well, we're not right downtown yet. Scott. <laughs> no, we're, we're like on, the, we're on a there's, ring there's, road or something. We've well, seen like five cars since we've gotten into the city. Maybe they have a really good public transportation network. I was mostly being sarcastic because I didn't really have any better answers than he did. And my confusion only deepened the farther we went. Uh, okay, well now we're downtown and now there's no cars here either. <laughs> Seriously, where is everybody? I'm so confused. I'd already felt a bit uncomfortable about Turkmenistan after researching the country prior to our trip. It had a pretty miserable human rights record, and it ranked third from the bottom in press freedom, just above Eritrea and North Korea. What's more, Mehdi, our guide in Iran, had told us about a trip he'd taken to Turkmenistan several years earlier, where it seemed like he and his group were constantly being watched. That's right, this guy came from Iran, which isn't exactly known for being the most democratic place, and even he was creeped out by Turkmenistan. Rosie and Jane were driving in the car ahead of us. They spoke up on the walkie-talkie and echoed what we were feeling. Uh, yeah, I don't know. What was that? Oh, they're all, no, you, you watch what you say on the walkie-talkie. What'd you say? They threw everybody into jail. It's fine. Drew, anyone could be listening. I just, just got to be careful. You don't have to tell them that and be like, the police. Drew, I don't want Everybody's anyone. An adult. But sometimes people don't think and we just got to have common sense. And as if to add credence to my fear that perhaps we were being monitored or watched, it was just a few minutes later as we approached an empty intersection that we were flagged to the side. Is he pulling us over? a cop in the middle directing traffic. I think he just pulled us over. We weren't speeding, and we couldn't figure out what we had done wrong, aside from driving ridiculous-looking rally cars with foreign plates. But maybe that was enough. The cop approached Rosie and Jane's car, since it was in the lead. He didn't write a ticket or seem like he was scolding us in any way. Instead, he simply held us there for several minutes, sort of engaging in small talk, but he didn't speak any English, and we couldn't understand any Turkmen, so we had no idea what he said. It's almost like he was stalling time while he listened to someone talking to him in some sort of earpiece. And then, this part is still hard to believe, but more cars suddenly started appearing on the roads around us, almost like actors walking on stage late for the performance, and he let us continue on our way. Looking back later on, we all tried to figure it out, but we couldn't quite shake the crazy feeling that we were in some sort of real-life Truman show, where Jim Carrey's character realized that everything was a facade, a show being put on just for him, and everyone around him seemed to somehow be in on it. Maybe I'm losing my mind. The whole experience shook us up a bit, so when my brother spoke to Rosie on the radio a short while later, she decided to urge caution. What's up with all these really, really weird monuments all over the place? Probably this is my paranoia speaking, she said. But we should probably be a little bit careful about what we say on this frequency, just in case we're being tracked. Told you. Sure, absolutely. See? Well, I don't think that was anything bad. The more time we spent in Turkmenistan, the weirder the country seemed. We arrived at our lodging for the night, an upscale five-story hotel in downtown Ashgabat. I wish I could show you a picture, but it was across the street from some sort of important government building, 
so the front desk clerk warned us photos were strictly prohibited. Overall, it was a pretty nice place, though, with two swimming pools, a spa, restaurant, and a gift shop. There was just one thing missing. Other people. Even at the breakfast buffet the next morning, there was only one other guest. Now, the logical part of me tried to come up with explanations. It is hard to get a visa to Turkmenistan, I figured, so maybe it's not so surprising that we'd be some of the few tourists. Plus, it was the middle of summer, the hottest and most uncomfortable time of the year, so maybe there were more visitors in cooler months. But as lots of little strange things continued to pile up, it became harder and harder to make sense of it all. I wondered at the time if we were going crazy, unknowingly assembling a series of random coincidences in our minds to manufacture some sort of black helicopter conspiracy theory. But I stopped pinching myself after speaking later on to another rallier named Joe Rittenhouse. He was also passing through Ashgabat around this time with his teammates from Pennsylvania and a bunch of their friends, and they had their own reasons to feel creeped out. We rolled into this hotel. It was about $100 a night. It had, like, really nice rooms, and we all decided, all right, we're going to stay here. And uh, two of our British friends, Elliot and I, I think it was Fergal, they were, like, trying to negotiate with this woman who'd be like, all right, come on, let's negotiate prices here. I, how about $80 or, like, $90 instead of 100 And the woman behind the counter was like, no, no. And she, like, pointed to all these cameras behind her, and she's like, they are always watching us. And... Elliot was like, holy crap, you know, what is she talking about? And so then we kind of settled in for the night, but it just got weirder and weirder as the night went on. There was an 11 p.m. citywide curfew, so a late night out on the town was out of the question. Luckily, their hotel had its own dance club. A bunch of the people in our group decided, hey, we've all just done it wrong. Let's go get some drinks because we haven't had alcohol in, you know, X amount of days. Let's just have a party. We went into the bar and we sat down and the guy from the bar was like, you should go down into disco. And we're like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And there's about, I'd say, 20 of us staying in this hotel. And it was weird because there were only about like six or seven people in that club. And then all of a sudden, like 20 of us rocked up and... We were having a blast and we were drinking a good amount. They're playing like Western music and we were just really excited. But then it just got so bizarre. Jamie, one of the Aussies that was with us, he bought a big bottle of vodka and it was like, you know, everybody gets shots. Well, they bought this bottle of vodka and we watched. They took the money, handed it to one of the, like, I guess, security guys in the room. And then he walked around and he paid all the Turkmen people dancing in the club. And one of the Scots with us was like, holy crap, look at this guy. And he walked over to this guy. He's a little intoxicated. And he's like, you were our border guard. You're the guy who stamped our passports. And they started to realize that like everybody in this club was somehow related to the border or the border guards or like government officials. And it just, all of a sudden, it just took this really weird and eerie tone because like, We were the ones dancing, they weren't drinking, they were just kind of watching us, and it was just so insane. That whole Ashgabat stay was really bizarre for us, because I constantly felt like we were being watched, I guess. In fact, I found this thing in the chandelier of our apartment when I was just drunkenly standing on my bed. And I looked up in the chandelier, and it's a bunch of plastic tubes hanging down. Like, you couldn't really see behind it. But there were buttons on the side of it. It had, like, a play record button. And there was a part for an SD card. And it looked like someone had put, like, a makeshift recording device into the chandelier. It could have been anything from, like, a sound system. But it was so bizarrely hidden that it was just really eerie for all of us when we were, like, in that hotel. That, once again, was an excerpt from episode 11 of the first season of Far From Home. It was called Turkmenistan, Just Plain Weird. If you enjoyed listening, please go back to the very beginning of my feed and check out my entire first season, where I documented my journey driving from London to Mongolia. And while you're at it, please stop by Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and leave me a rating or a review. And as always, you could drop me a line at info at farfromhomepodcast.org to let me know what you think. You could also follow Far From Home on Instagram or Facebook to see photos and videos, and visit my website at farfromhomepodcast.org for tons of bonus content. 
Until next time, I'm Scott Gurian. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.